Hey everyone, so today's lecture is on acids and bases and buffers and pKa. It's going to be great. Let's get started. So first things first, we need to talk about solubility. And so that's when we take some kind of solute and we dissolve it into a solvent. Now, usually we're thinking about uh, whatever our solvent is. If you've taken general chemistry or organic chemistry, it can be a number of things, some kind of liquid usually. Uh, if it's water as your solvent, that's hydration when we actually dissolve our solute into that. Uh, a lot of times uh, the easiest way to think about it is, you know, like sodium chloride into water. That's pretty straightforward. But the issue with biochemistry is that we're going to usually maintain water as our solvent, but we can expand the kind of things that we actually dissolve into water. And so when we're in the blood or in other fluids that we deal with in biological systems, when we're actually encountering these things, I mean, we can see big molecules actually be solvated um, and or well hydrated. And so that's when you get bigger molecules that actually will be dissolved into water. And so you can get these uh, this idea of like an amphipathic molecule could be dissolved in water. Uh, uh, proteins can be uh, solvated into water. And so just the idea of things being in water molecules and then being surrounded by water molecules and the complexities that happen along there, just an important idea, okay? So we're gonna be talking about acids and bases and buffers first. So buffers are what we're gonna spend a lot of time talking about, but in order to understand buffers, we have to talk about acids and bases. So buffers are gonna act like hydrogen or hydroxide ion inks. Inks, really, sinks. <laughs> if you have too many hydrogen ions, okay, so that means there's too many and that can be dangerous, right? So if you're in a super acidic environment, that could be really bad. Or if you're in a super basic environment, that could be really bad too, it can be really dangerous. And so uh, just like uh, if you have a computer, like I'm talking into a computer right now, uh, there are heat sinks, in case you didn't know what that is, that's what uh, this metal here is, and it collects the heat. Uh, the, the heat is drawn into this metal and then sent out. Uh, and so that's what we're kind of doing with a buffer system. So with a buffer system, we're using uh, a different chemical or a different molecule to actually sort of absorb those hydrogen ions or hydroxide ions to prevent excess hydrogen ions from damaging things or excess hydroxide ions from damaging things. So, but first we need to talk about acids and bases and stuff, as I say. Uh, pH is super duper important. We need to understand what pH means, especially in biological systems. It's very, very key. So I have this picture here from a Nature Reviews article just talking about uh, the pH changes just within the cell. And you can see the nucleus is relatively neutral, but then uh, these other, uh, as we enter the endomembrane network uh, and we enter different vesicles, we can see that the pH is gonna change. Typically it gets more acidic the farther away you get from the nucleus. And that has huge implications uh, for, at least I, I was a virologist for a long time, I guess I still am, and uh, viruses will take advantage of this. Uh, and so when we alter the pH, which we're gonna end up talking about that at the very end, uh, as pH changes, you can actually physically change what your protein structure will be, which is really, really cool. So you can imagine if you start out really acidic, your proteins are gonna be structured in one way. And then as you travel deeper into the cell or vice versa, uh, your protein structure can actually change. And we take advantage of that. And lots of viruses also take advantage of that to get their protein structures to change. But first, we need to talk about pH and what that actually means. In order to talk about pH, it's something that you may have encountered before, especially if you took general chemistry. pH, really straightforward. So the H refers to hydrogen ions, and the OH refers to a hydroxide ion, and the P means you're going to take the negative log, okay, a little bit of math, don't worry, there's not too much math here, I am not a mathematician, but it's pretty straightforward. If we take the negative log of the concentration, so remember that when we put brackets around something, so in this case, hydrogen ions, okay, that means we're looking at the concentration. And so when I take the pH of hydrogen ions, I'm taking the negative log of it. And you can have the pOH as well. Usually in most life uh, in the news, I don't know why you would see pH in the news, but if you're gonna see it anywhere, you're gonna see pH, right? It's referring to acidity. But I mean, that's just convention. pOH is just as relevant. Uh, so we need to talk about what that means, okay? So pH is one thing, and now we need to talk about Ka, okay? So it's our constant for our acid. Ka is equal to 
this equation, okay? So we've got our concentration of hydroxide ions, awesome. And then we've got our acid and our conjugate base, right? So this is our acid, it's our acid, which could be anything, any acid, with the hydrogen attached. And then if it loses that hydrogen to this location, then we're left with this acid and it's lost that positive charge, so it thus has a negative charge. So that's our conjugate base, okay? I know a lot of this is review, but hey, we're gonna do it. So if pH, let's go back to pH, pH means I take the negative log of something. So what about the pKa? Well, I take the negative log of the Ka, right? And we know that Ka is this equation. So if I take pKa, means I take the negative log of that, so I could plug this equation into where Ka is, right? Boom, look at that. So if I take the pKa, that means I'm taking the negative log of that thing, okay? So pKa is a more helpful number for us, especially when we're dealing with proteins. Because you can say, oh, okay, like I understand pH is how many hydrogen ions are floating around. Okay, that's fine. But that's usually dealing with the solvent and the environment. What we really want to look at is the acid and the base and the pKa is going to be a really, really nice way to give us one solid number to tell us whether or not something is going to have a hydrogen ion attached or not, okay? And so the lower the number, just like pH, so the lower the number, the more acidic it is, okay? So the lower the pKa, the more strong an acid it is, okay? So that was a really weird way to say that. The smaller the pKa, the stronger the acid. So they match up with pH and pKa, okay? So uh, hopefully that's pretty straightforward. Now, uh, the other thing I want to talk about is the henderson hasselbach So that's how we can actually start to kind of associate these two things together. So I can associate my pH, uh, my actual number of hydrogen ions actually makes sense. It's my pKa, which is this, right? The negative log of this, how many hydrogen ions I have, right? Basically. And then I'm also going to include the log of my acid and base with its conjugate base. So it's henderson hasselbach uh, If you've taken general chemistry, you probably had to do equations involving this, uh, but we're not gonna spend too much time on it. I wanna get to some more practicality of pKa. What in the world does it really mean? Why am I even talking about this? Great question. So pKa is a great way to tell you the strength of an acid, okay? pH uh, is a good way, like a pH tells us, you know, the environment, hey, the, like, I threw an acid into a solution and the pH was three or whatever, that's pretty acidic, okay? But it's not really telling you specifically for that acid, it's not super helpful. And so what we're going to do is look at the pKa. So the lower the pKa, the stronger the acid, okay? I.e., pKa tells me how likely it is that my hydrogen ion will separate from the actual acid molecule itself, okay? So strong acids, right, they're really strong, have really low pKa's, that matches up. A really strong low pKa acid will thus drive a lower pH, okay? They're not exactly the same though. pH is referring to the environment, pKa is referring to the acid itself, and I can use the acid to affect the environment, okay? Does that make sense? I hope so. Uh, I'm trying to be pretty clear about it. Uh, believe me, I struggle with some of this stuff too. So, weaker acids have higher pKa's. And so I found this uh, nice little chart here. There's like only one of these charts that exists. So the quality is not the greatest. But uh, here we've got our pKa's. So remember, Ka is this equation. It's our hydrogen ions with its conjugate base divided by together, the concentration of the acid itself. And so that's Ka, and I'm just taking the negative log of that. And that just gives us an easier uh, number to look at. Uh, when you're looking at Ka, as you can see, like it can be, it's easier to do it in uh, scientific notation, and it can get really weird if you're, it's basically the number of hydrogen ions that are available. And so pKa just makes it a lot easier. And it's just like pH, and so the lower we get down here, we get our strong acids. Notice it's not referring to the environment, it's referring to the acid. And then down here, uh, where it gets a little bit bigger, it's just like pH. Uh, the, a higher pH means a, uh, higher, a lower concentration of hydrogen ions, thus a higher concentration of hydroxide ions. But in the terms of pKa, that means it's a weaker acid. That means it's less likely to give up its hydrogen ion, okay? Strong acids will give up their hydrogen ions readily, weak acids not as readily.
okay? Now, we need to look at specifically a couple molecules here just to get us, uh, get our brains thinking about pKa. So in this case, <clears throat> when we're referring to pKa, uh, we can expand on this as well. So if I have a really low pKa, that's, that means it's a strong acid, then it means it readily gives up its hydrogen, right? And so the opposite is true. The larger the number, the uh, more likely it is to not give up its hydrogen and to actually accept a hydrogen, okay? And so let's look here. So we've got water down here. Water has a pKa of 14, which is actually relatively weak, uh, which is a good thing. We want water to be a weak acid slash a weak base. Okay? It's kind of in between the two. So it has a pKa of 14, and so you usually use pKa's, you, we compare them to each other. And so in this case, we've got ammonia up here. And so if I have ammonia, ammonia does not want to give up these hydrogens, like at all, okay? And so it's going to have a pKa of 37. It is highly highly unlikely to give up that hydrogen. It really doesn't want to, okay? Oxygen is fine having just two covalent bonds, right? That's, it's, that's just what it likes. It likes two covalent bonds to have its uh, outer orbital filled. Nitrogen wants three. And so to actually break that hydrogen off, it is possible, absolutely. But it's really, really difficult. And you're gonna be left with this goofy looking ammonia uh, charge thing. And so we've got our weird pKa here, a huge pKa. So that means it is a very strong base, right? So it will readily uh, accept a hydrogen, but it does not want to give it up. Okay? Water less so. It has a lower pKa, and thus it will more readily give up that hydrogen. Okay? Now, pH, yes, is helpful to indicate how many hydrogen ions are present, but it is indirectly related to the acids and bases themselves. Okay? And so that's why we're talking about pKa. I'm going to keep hammering that home, okay? So pH is about the environment. pKa is about the specific acids and bases themselves. Let's talk a little bit about the practicality of pH and pKa together, okay? So we know pKa is a specific number that uh, tells us whether or not a, an acid or a base or whatever the molecule is, is going to give up its hydrogen ion, okay? Which sometimes we want it to, sometimes we don't. It depends on the environment. So the key to the environment is the pH, and the pH is gonna tell us how many hydrogen ions there are. If it's really low, that means there's a ton of hydrogen ions around, right? So why in the world would my acid give up its hydrogen ion if there's a bunch of hydrogen ions already there? Well, that's where our pKa and pH are gonna to come together to tell us some stuff, okay? So pKa is the pH value, okay, at which a molecule will accept or donate a proton, okay? So what we're referring to is pKa is the magic fulcrum of protonation, okay? So here I have my acetic acid. There's the hydrogen that it would give up, okay? So it has a relatively low pKa of five. So we can compare that pKa to the pH of a, an environment that we're going to put it into. Okay? Now, if it's a low pH, okay, if it's below 5, that means there's a bunch of hydrogen ions there, right? pH is measuring how many hydrogen ions are there. The lower it is, the more there are. Okay? So if my pH is below 5, that means there's so many hydrogen ions around that acetic acid is not going to give up its uh, hydrogen. Why would it? Okay? It's just going to, uh, there's so many hydrogen ions, it's not going to give it up, okay? So that's how we can use this number of, uh, for its pKa versus the pH of the environment that we're putting it into, okay? Now, let's see what happens if I pull it down here and put it into like a basic liquid, okay? So let's look down here. Oh, oh, oh. Look at that. Wow, look at that fancy animation. It lost its hydrogen ion. Look at that because the pH of the environment was basic enough to accept the hydrogen that it would donate. Okay? But we don't have to think about it in those terms. All we have to do is look at the pKa versus the pH. So if my pH of my environment is less than the pKa, i.e. it's more acidic, pKa tells us whether or not it's gonna donate its hydrogen. So if my pH is super acidic compared to the pKa, then it's gonna stay protonated. It's not gonna give up its proton. Why would it? There's excess protons in, this, in the liquid. But if the pH of our environment 
is greater than, i.e. more basic than the pKa of my compound, right? So I have a relatively acidic compound here. So if I put it into a basic liquid, it's going to deprotonate. It's going to lose that hydrogen. So pKa and pH can tell us whether or not a molecule will give up its hydrogen or not. Kind of cool, right? I can hear you out in the audience. You're saying, well, yeah, it's super cool. So let's do another example and test out my amazing animation abilities. So here we're going to take phenol. So this is a higher pKa. So uh, acetic acid, we were, I was just showing you, that has a pKa of 5. It's relatively acidic. So it l generally, in most situations, will donate its acid. And remember, we're usually dealing in biological systems, which, uh, so like inside the cell or in your blood, is usually relatively neutral. So it's around 7. And so in the case of acetic acid, its pKa is 5, which is more acidic than 7 and thus it will usually donate its proton, right? And so let's look at a more basic molecule. So we've got our phenol here, and there's the hydrogen that it can donate, and it has a, a higher pKa, so it's a, a pKa of 10. So it's less likely to donate its hydrogen. So let's see. So if we take it over here, so remember, we're always comparing our pKa to our pH. So if we uh, take it and put it in, uh, I have the same jars from earlier, plus a more basic liquid. And so I've got our phenol here. I'm going to dunk it into, into our liquid here, and the, the hydrogen's staying. Okay, so that must mean the pH, it's really acidic. There's tons of hydrogen. So why in the world would phenol donate its hydrogen away? It wouldn't, right? Now, our pKa is 10, and so compared to a pH of, of 9, that's 9 is still more acidic than 10, so it's probably not going to give up its hydrogen. Now, always remember, it, there are some of them, a small percentage of the phenols would give up their hydrogen, but the equilibrium is established so that uh, it's a really small percentage, okay? But in, in this case, we're comparing pH to, to pKa, and we can see that it would not give up its hydrogen. Now, <laughs> oh man, I hope this works. So now we're going to go into this really basic liquid. You know, it's blue, so you know it's basic. And we're going to drag it down here, and oh, look at that. It gave up its proton. No, yeah, I, there would be a negative. I couldn't figure out how to make it have like a little minus sign there, okay? But hey, you get the idea. It lost that hydrogen because I put it into a really basic liquid. So the pKa of the phenol is more acidic, if you will, than the pH. The pH is 12, which is relatively basic and this pKa is more acidic than that, therefore it gives up its hydrogen. Wow, look at that animation, pretty cool. I'm gonna show you a few examples of pKa's because now that we understand it, uh, now that you understand pKa, when you actually look at molecules pKa's now, uh, it kind of gives you a little bit more to think about. So hydrochloric acid is one of the strongest acids we have, right? It really loves to give up that hydrogen. So <laughs> your pH would have to be <laughs> incredibly low to <laughs> not have hydrochloric acid give up its hydrogen. So it's basically never going to happen. But that's why it has a pKa that's so low. It's actually a negative pKa. That's kind of crazy. Uh, and then as we move down, we start moving into a slightly <laughs> less acidic things, but it's still pretty acidic. The carboxylic acid is still relatively acidic. It's usually, in biological systems at least, going to give up that proton. Uh, now, now when we move to phenols, okay, so there's phenol, we just did phenol, okay, it's pK of 10, okay, awesome. Alcohol, less so, right, and we're becoming more and more basic. So we're now in the kind of weaker acid, weak bases, right, so they're kind of just treading the line between the two, and then we're going to become stronger and stronger bases, right, so these are the ones that are more readily able to take up a hydrogen, and the odds that they will actually give up the hydrogen is really, really low, right? So the lower the pKa, that's a measure of how, basically how well you want to give up your hydrogen. And so if it's a really high, that means you really don't want to give it up. But the opposite is also true that you will take it. Okay? So hopefully that's relatively straightforward. These are a couple of the more relevant biological ones, thiols we're going to see a lot. We're going to see amides or amides, however you want to say it. Um, we're going to see these all the time. And so uh, we can see the pKa's are actually in, like in blood, would be 
they would maintain these hydrogens. The thiol is going to come back up uh, in a later lecture because the thiol group is what's going to allow our cysteine residues on our amino acids to actually form disulfide bonds. And you need to have this hydrogen there in order to actually form the disulfide bond. So usually in a biological system, this hydrogen is still going to be there because in a biological system with a pH of 7, this has a pKa of 10, therefore it will not give up its hydrogen. Okay? Uh, there are some other examples. Uh, this slide specifically I wanted to address the idea that pKa can vary with temperature. Okay, Usually we're talking standard temperature and pressure, so it's not usually a big issue, but in biological systems, we do have a higher temperature. So that's what this is trying to refer to. Uh, these are all buffers. Um, I've used uh, HEPs and I've used TRIS before. Uh, they're buffers for different things. So like if you wanted to do like a Western blot with, um, uh, uh, with the proteins and separate out proteins, then you would use a buffer. And so uh, how your buffer is gonna work is it's going to control the amount of hydrogens around. But that can change with temperature, and that's just something I wanted to hit, uh, because that kind of makes sense. Temperature is energy, basically. It's vibrations of atoms. And so if I raise the temperature up, it can lower the pKa of my molecule. It's basically making it... Uh, so if my pKa goes down, that means my molecule is more likely to donate its hydrogen. But that makes sense, because I'm putting energy into the system. That means it's more likely... Uh, I picture these uh, acids are kind of vibrating more as the temperature goes up. I'm like shaking in my chair now. So the, the molecule is vibrating more, which means it's more likely to accidentally throw that proton off. Okay, So that's basically where temperature comes into play. Okay, <laughs> okay I'm going to stop shaking in my chair. Uh, a couple questions, uh, typical questions that I would uh, ask on an exam. Um, at a pH of 4, would acetic acid with a pKa of 5 exist in its protonated or deprotonated form? Well, that's a great question. Now that you know what pKa means compared to pH, you should be able to say that. Uh, what about at pH 7, would a simple alcohol group with a pKa of 16 exist in its protonated or deprotonated form? Well, you should be able to answer that question. Or if I showed you, uh, here's an acetic acid, what would that look like at pH of 9? Oh, well, I'm saying, okay, you need to know what acetic acid is. Okay, so I'm usually going to give you these things. So if you had an acetic acid, and I would tell you what the pKa is, and I said, okay, what does it look like at pH 9? Well, does it have that proton attached or not? Good question. All right, so why are we even talking about pKa so much? I'm going to say that term so many times. Well, amino acids, which is what makes up proteins, we're in biochemistry, people. We need to talk about proteins all the time. Well, amino acids have tons of pKa's all over. Basically, you can have three pKa's for the functional groups of amino acids. Now, I say functional groups. So amino acids are comprised of three separate things. Okay? You've got your amino group, You've got your carboxylic acid group, and then you have your R group, okay? Which we're usually going to refer to that uh, as our functional group. Sometimes I'll accidentally use that. What I really mean is the R group, okay? So every amino acid has these two, okay? And that's so we got our carboxylic acid down here, which it's an acid. It wants to give up that hydrogen pretty readily. So if you're in blood, which is a pH of 7, okay? So we blood's pH of 7. So if my pKa is 2, Therefore, it's usually going to give up this hydrogen because my pKa of 2 means that it is a, uh, a stronger acid than the pH environment. So it would, the, the environment will readily accept that hydrogen. And so this will get rid of it. And so usually when we see amino acids in uh, the biological systems, we're going to see them uh, lose this proton here. So your carboxylic acid will be deprotonated. Now, your amino group is the opposite problem, okay? So it has a pKa of 10, which is higher than pH of 7. So in the blood, which is pH of 7, then it would not lose its hydrogen to the blood. Okay, so you're going to use it, you'll see it just as this nice little amino group. It's going to look like that, whereas this one would be an oxygen with a negative uh, symbol there for, because it got deprotonated. Now, your R groups are going to vary. And that's where we're going to get into amino acids. When we talk about proteins, we're going to see this. And it's going to help explain why some R groups on some of the proteins are slightly more acidic. So uh, why are some 
uh, amino acids called acids, like glutamic acid. Why is it called that? Well, because it's our group has a pKa that's relatively low. And so it's going to give up that hydrogen, just like the carboxylic acid group. So you can see here we have glutamic acid, it's GLU with a code E, and it has a pKa of four on its R group. That's pretty low. And so it's more likely to give up that hydrogen than a more neutral amino acid, like, I don't know, alanine or something. So uh, pKa's are really, really important. I put them all into this slide set, and um, I picked one that shows the pKa for each group and for each amino acid. I apologize, the quality is a little bit lower because this is it's like a really big chart, uh, but I cut out each section so that I could just show you um, the, uh, so the amino acids here, we've got our uh, charged side chains, right? So if we've got our uh, relatively high pKa's down here for lysine and arginine, um, We've got a relatively neutral, well, it's slightly more acidic for histidine. So histidine is typically going to drop off this hydrogen if it's in like blood, let's say. But here's a tricky one. So think about histidine. It's really, uh, it's a pKa of six, right? So uh, the nucleus of a cell is seven-ish. And so uh, the pKa of six is lower than seven. So it would typically donate its hydrogen uh, in the nucleus. So that's fine. But as you leave the nucleus and start entering the endoplasmic system, the endomembrane system, we saw earlier, uh, here I can jump to it really fast, we saw that as we leave the nucleus, we're going to start entering, uh, our pH is going to go down. So it's going to get like 6. If we're going to get secreted, it's going to be like 5.5 uh, lysosomes or 4.7. That's pretty acidic. And so if my histidine is, if I have a protein with histidine in there, then it, when it enters those endomembrane systems, it will actually become protonated, okay? Because the pKa is now higher than the pH of the surroundings. And so it would accept that proton, which is really interesting. So that's going to change the relative charge of this R group, which could change the folding pattern of the protein itself. That's how we can get proteins to kind of shift their shapes. So all you have to do is change the pH of your environment and you can get your proteins to change, which is really, really cool. That's one of the main ways that we're gonna control how proteins actually work and function inside of biological systems, i.e. cells. Really, really cool stuff. Um, so uh, this, uh, I'm just gonna leave these on here. I'm not gonna go through every pKa, uh, but you can see uh, for the most part, um, the carboxylic acid groups have uh, relatively low pKa's, they're pretty much always going to donate their protons, though notice they're not identical. So we have 2.13, 2.2, 2.16, 2.18. Those are essentially the same, but they aren't all the same. And that has to do with the interactions that are going on between uh, the other groups. So like the amino group and the R groups as well. Okay. But you can notice the amino groups here uh, tend to be relatively, uh, they're usually going to keep the hydrogens on there, but it's not huge, right? So the, the difference here can, uh, that might make a difference later on. Let's, uh, let's keep that in our brains. So we're going to keep going here. I just list, listed all of these, um, all of these things. Also, you can click on the chart and, uh, if you click on crop, uh, you can see, I just copied and pasted the entire chart and then zoomed in and cropped it out. And so if you want the whole chart, you can just go to one of these slides and find the whole chart. Now there are uh, lists obviously for all the, for the carboxy group, for the amino group, for all the side chains. Uh, some of the side chains, we just don't even list the pKa because uh, it just doesn't make sense. Uh, you would never lose uh, the pKa for most of them are gonna be massive, like 50s or 60s, because your carbon is not gonna just give up one of those hydrogens willy-nilly. Okay, so it's not even biologically relevant, but some of them it is. So your acidic amino acids, you know, your aspartic acid, your glutamic acid, yeah, they have pretty low pKa's. And most, most of the time they're gonna give up those uh, hydrogens. And then you got those basic ones, most of the time they're going to uh, accept hydrogens, okay? So that's kind of cool. Another application that we can take from this is uh, we can look for something called the isoelectric point, okay? So this is where we're going to compare, we're going to take pH, so there's the pH of our environment down here, and when we take an amino acid, so this is just for amino acids, and what we're going to do is we're going to take uh, an amino acid at a specific pH, 
and see what it looks like, okay? So uh, in this case, let's look at alanine here. So we've got our amino group, we've got our carboxylic acid here, and it's got this methyl group sticking off here, okay? Now, when we're in our Zwitter ion form, so that means we've uh, our carboxylic acid has lost its proton, but our amino group has not. Um, so we're kind of in between the two. So our isoelectric point is going to be at pH 6. So that's where we're kind of in between the two. We're not a cation, okay? We don't have just a positive charge. And we're not an anion. We don't have just a negative charge. We're in between. We have balanced it out, okay? That's our isoelectric point. It's going to depend on the amino acid. And you can figure them out for entire proteins. So basically, you can take all the amino acids and uh, lump them together and sort of combine all of their pKa's together, the presence or absence of pH or of the hydrogens, and you can take that and it will establish itself as an entire protein, one isoelectric point. Well, why is that relevant? Well, that's a way to separate out proteins. And so what we can do is we can take an entire protein, not just amino acid, but an entire protein, and we can put it on a membrane that has a low pH, right? So it's really acidic on this way, and then it gets less acidic and more basic on this side. And our proteins will then move towards their isoelectric point. So they're trying to basically balance out so they become uh, balanced. So the, the positive charge and the negative charge are balanced, which we know the pKa is going to control that based on the pH, right? So uh, <laughs> suffice to say, they move, all right? And how, why do we do that? Well, it helps us separate stuff. Uh, there's a lot of text here. I wrote this out if you want to spend more time on this, but basically, uh, when we run all our proteins on a membrane, they can separate by their isoelectric point, that's the IP, isoelectric point, and then uh, you're going to put it onto a Western and run it on a gel, and that will separate it by mass. And so this is one way that you can separate, oh my goodness, I'm so sorry. That's one way that you can separate out proteins. And then you could say, oh, okay, I really want a protein that um, has a very acidic isoelectric point, so it'd be over here, and I want it to be 500 kilodaltons or whatever. That would probably be huge. But um, so it would be up here because the bigger ones don't pack, go as fast. And so they'd be up here. So you could isolate a specific protein that way. Uh, why is this relevant? Well, you can use isoelectric focusing is what it's called when we actually do that to look for specific things. Okay. So in this case, uh, I found an example of how they would test for erythropoietin, erythropoietin, however you want to say it. Um, that's a performance enhancing drug that you can take and, and increases your uh, red blood cell production. So uh, athletes can use it to, uh, if you boost your red blood cell count, then you can increase the amount of oxygen that you can hold on to, and then it just uh, makes you a better athlete. And so you can do that artificially with erythropoietin. There are uh, just variations within humans. Uh, we don't have to talk about uh, red blood cell production. Anyway, but uh, different humans have different adaptations, and so you can actually find some athletes will just have naturally boosted red blood cell production for whatever reason. But you could artificially do that with erythropoietin. So I want you to look over here. So these are the most important ones. This is uh, a urine test, so there's somebody peed in a cup, and then we uh, use isoelectric focusing to separate out the proteins, okay? And then we're going to uh, pull them down on our SDS page, and over here, this is a positive sample. Uh, this is our, uh, our positive control here. Uh, or no, yeah, no, this is our positive control. This is some other kind of positive control. And these are both positive urine samples, and then this is our negative urine sample. Okay, so you can see they are different. And you use isoelectric focusing to actually separate out the proteins, and then you can tell things by it. So that's just a practical application of isoelectric focusing, which obviously is related to pH and related to the pKa of amino acids. Now, we're going to move on to buffers. Remember, they are hydrogen sinks. Now, I'm going to post the video for the crash course in chemistry. Okay, so crash course, you may have seen their videos before. They are awesome. Uh, all the crash courses are great. Uh, the science ones are really, really good. Uh, their one for buffers is awesome. It gives really good examples of buffers and buffer systems. In uh, It gives a really good example of a naturally occurring buffer system that exists in water systems. But um, so I will put that below, but I wanted to talk a little bit about some biological buffers that we're going to encounter 
um, especially if you want to maybe go into medical school, you want to be an actual doctor, uh, well, I should say a physician, then uh, we need to talk a little bit about buffers and some of the buffers in biological systems. So remember, buffers are things that can basically suck up extra hydrogen ions or hydroxide ions so that the overall pH of something doesn't change. So that's really, really important. So I was mentioning earlier that if we are going to, uh, so our, my example was um, histidine, right? So if histidine is in the nucleus, it's going to look like this. If histidine is in the um, one of the more acidic endomembranes, then it's going to uh, be protonated, okay? So that can actually drastically change what your protein looks like. And so if you start messing with pH, especially in biological systems, you can really, really change what's going on. So we need to buffer things. So if I throw a bunch of hydrogen ions in something, I don't want it to change really fast, if, at least if I'm a biological system. So for example, uh, acetate trihydrate is a, a buffer that you can just buy. And uh, some people did a really simple experiment. So they took uh, egg yolks, okay, which have proteins and all kinds of stuff in them. And uh, on the top here, we, <laughs> This is just egg yolks, okay, non-buffered, good, uh, good negative control. And then over here we have our uh, our testing group. So we're gonna they took hydrochloric acid and put it on there, and it turned orange. Okay, cool. And then they took um, uh, sodium hydroxide and put it on the egg yolk, and it turned green, uh, very green. <laughs> and so uh, that's kind of cool. And so they said, all right, well, uh, here's our uh, other negative control for the buffered ones. Uh, they didn't add anything here. They added acetate trihydrate to both. And then they added hydrochloric acid and sodium hydroxide. Okay, so notice up here for this acid, they only added one drop of hydrogen chloride, uh, or hydrochloric acid, I'm sorry, and that's what happened. Down here they added 50 drops of one molar hydrochloric acid and nothing happened. And over here they added 50 drops of sodium hydroxide and nothing happened. So the acetate trihydrate is an awesome buffer. So it absorbed extra hydrogens, it absorbed extra hydroxides, and prevented uh, the pH from changing so much that it actually damaged the proteins. Very, very cool. Uh, we can look at a graph of acetic acid. Okay? And uh, this is a typical graph that you would see. So if you were plotting pH on our y-axis over here, and down here we have <laughs> milliliters, that's like a ton of sodium hydroxide, but it's fine. Uh, <laughs> this graph is fine, but it would make more sense to do the concentration, not the volume, but whatever. So we can see uh, it, this is where our, we're buffering. Okay, So our pH is only varying by one or two uh, units uh, for this region. However, you can overwhelm or basically fill up your um, buffer with hydrogens. And once that's full, then all the excess hydrogens are just going to spill into the solution. And now you have a, a massive amount. Well, this is the opposite. So this is hydroxide groups, right? We're doing sodium hydroxide. But the, the same would hold true for an acid. It would just kind of be flipped. Uh, but you just get all those excess ions, whether you're looking at a hydrogen ion or a hydroxide ion, and they spill into the system, and it drastically changes it. So look at that. It's super fast. Uh, and uh, that would be bad. That would kill you. Okay, so that's not good. So in biological systems, we do see tons of buffering systems. Bicarbonate being one of the most common ones, and the phosphate buffer system is a uh, another minor one relatively, and then protein buffering systems is one of the uh, also big ones that people don't really talk about that much. Um, so if you're looking, uh, if you're a doctor, you need to understand that there are buffering systems. And if people start getting their buffering systems out of whack, that can really screw people up, okay? So uh, your protein buffering system, that's where your amino acids act as buffers. And so as your pH goes up, you have those amino groups, okay, that are able to absorb extra hydrogens, okay? So or I'm over here. So uh, you have this amino group that is able to take on an extra hydrogen. That's awesome. So if your pH is getting too low, i.e. there's lots of hydrogen floating around, uh, then it can take that up. Awesome. So that's acting like a, a small little buffer there. And the opposite is also true. Uh, if you're becoming relatively basic, then you can give up one of those hydrogen ions uh, and uh, sort of neutralize the hydroxides that are floating around. And so your protein buffer system can be really nice. It's relatively minor compared to some of the uh, uh, 
buffering systems in the biological, uh, like in a human body, uh, because those ones are they're distinctly designed to be buffer systems. Uh, whereas the proteins, it's kind of a secondary goal. I mean, really, the point of amino acids is to build proteins, not to be buffers. But hey, it's a nice secondary attribute. Uh, but if we move back up, uh, the phosphate buffer system and the uh, bicarbonate buffer system is usually what it's referred to. Uh, those are two of the biggies. And so if you have a patient who is going through renal failure or is just having some issues with their kidneys, um, that's where it can start messing with things. Because remember, if you start messing with somebody's pH, especially in their blood, you can really, really mess things up. So if you start changing the pH even just a little bit, you saw how small we can measure those pKa's. Uh, you can change somebody's life real fast by changing their pH. And so one of those systems is the bicarbonate system and we're going to talk a little bit about this one and the phosphate buffer system and that's the last thing i'm going to talk about so in the bicarbonate system we have uh bicarb so usually we think about that as like sodium bicarbonate like if you're baking or whatever because it's an artificial uh, leavening agent and so um we've got our uh, bicarbonate here and we can give or take hydrogens into that and that has to do, uh, we can then pull those away and separate out uh, between water and carbon dioxide. And so based on how you're breathing can actually adjust your pH a little bit. Um, and so uh, we can take those hydrogens in, we can take those hydrogens out. It depends. I mean, like if you're drinking a bunch of like, I don't know, lemonade and it's super acidic, then you're introducing a massive amount of acid into your body system, but you don't instantly become acidic for a variety of reasons, but this is one of them. Or uh, if you are, your kidneys are clearing these things out. So we need to talk about what do we do if we have extra hydrogens? Okay, so it's fine. Like you can, if you want to dig deeper, there are tons of resources to dig deeper into the bicarbonate buffer system. However, I just want to talk about if we have extra hydrogens, what do we do? Okay, so where do we store this bicarbonate? Okay, well, your kidneys are the main one that we're going to be talking about. And what do we do if we have extra hydrogens? Well, your other buffer systems can deal with it, but we need to talk about why are the kidneys so important for establishing this buffer system? Okay, well, let's take a look here. So we're moving into the kidney here. And so we've got uh, this, uh, this drawing is beautiful. I got it from some, um, uh, I did not put the link. Oh, that's so crazy. I, hang on from uh, Novobiosis. Thank you, Novobiosis, and some artists that they paid. Uh, it's a huge picture, uh, so that's what's making this PowerPoint huge. Um, so we've got our kidney here, we're moving to the cortex, our cortical nephron, and then we go to the glomerulus, and we're looking at the proximal tubule cells here, okay? So we're gonna go from the blood, uh, which is gonna pass along near here, and then into the kidney, and then that's gonna be uh, your urine, basically. And so we need to talk about, I know there's a lot going on, so don't worry, I'm gonna take you through it. So uh, the connection between, so these are those cells, okay, these are the same cells, okay. And so we're gonna move from our blood into the urine, okay? And so the connection between the bicarbonate buffer system and the phosphate buffer system, this is where that happens, okay? So basically, we've got our excess hydrogens and our bicarb can absorb those, okay? It's going to absorb those and head into the uh, proximal tubule cells, okay? And that's where we can pull away one of those hydrogens from the bicarbonate, and that hydrogen can then get pumped into the tubule lumen, okay? And we're going to combine it with our phosphate, okay? Which it's our hydrophosphate, and then it takes up, so you see we have one hydrogen here, and now we have two hydrogen. Okay. So we can then uh, get rid of that hydrogen. So now we're eliminating it completely from the body system, which is great. And then we're going to recycle that carb. And so that's going to go back out. And uh, the key to what's going on here is that uh, all the transports that are going on, uh, because uh, the chlorine, um, to get the bicarb back into the blood, we co-pump it with chlorine, which is something that we'll talk about at a later time, um, having, the, uh, having two pumps running at the same time. Anyway, so really, really cool. This is happening inside of you all the time. And if you have a patient who has some disruptions in their kidney, you can see if you're not fixing your bicarb system or you're not transporting things properly, 
or whatever is going on, then you're going to be really, really dangerous because you're going to be changing the pH of your system. Uh, if you're not doing any one of these things, it can just straight up kill you. So it's really scary. Uh, but that's buffering systems. So that's the idea of like a weak acid or weak base being able to absorb hydrogen or hydroxide ions and maintain pH. And so being able to eliminate the excess hydrogen, that's what's really, really important about this system. So that's the last slide I have to talk about acids and bases and buffers and PKA. I hope that was helpful. If you have any questions, let me know.